was lost in darkest night, yet thought I knew the way, the sin that promised joy and life had led me to the grave. I had no hope that you would own a rebel to your will, and if you had not loved But as I ran my hellbound race, indifferent to the cost, you looked upon my helpless state and led me to the cross. And I beheld God's love displayed, you suffered in my place, you bore the wrath reserved for I may not look like your typical pastor on Sunday morning. I shared with Joan that I would come the way I normally come to church, and that is wearing a robe. And so I thought I'd just spend a couple moments telling you why some pastors dress this way. It's not that we're endeavoring to be different from everybody else. Um, I have my own personal little phobia about being very informal in church. We want church to be a comfortable place, but we don't want it to be another bar stool on the next seat down. So, so why pastors oftentimes dress this way is that Every profession has its 
uniform. If you're a farmer, you know you don't wear a three-piece suit out to spread manure. And if you're a fireman, you know what a fireman is going to wear. And if you are a policeman, you know what to expect the policeman to wear. If you're a teacher, you know how you dress for school. And even all these things are changing. This is traditionally what a pastor would wear. In reform circles, he would wear, and traditionally it was a he, he would wear a black Geneva robe. And the purpose behind it um, was to cover up the incidentals of the pastor. Is his tie too wide? Is his tie too narrow? Does it have a stain from last Sunday's dinner on it? You know, it covers a multitude of sins. And it looks very much like a, a lawyer's robe or a judge's robe because John Calvin, the founder of our faith, was an attorney. And so an attorney's robe. Black, it keeps the pastor's personality out. The next item are these green things, and they change with the seasons. These are stoles. A stole is a mark of a pastor, and it is also the mark of a shepherd. And so pastors traditionally wear stoles. And because in our Reformed church, we've always had a highly educated clergy. It wasn't that somebody just got an idea that God's calling me to ministry, so I'm a minister. That in your church, in our church, a pastor is required to have a bachelor's degree and then a master's degree and specialized training in the pastoral arts. And so this hood is an academic hood that many pastors wear for special occasions, Easter, Christmas, the sacraments. And because we're celebrating the Lord's Supper this morning, um, that's why I'm dressed this way. I think the last time I was here, I just had my green soles that I wore on my shirt. And that's because not every church is familiar. Not every church is appreciative. But uh, out of respect for what we're doing today, I've decided to come dressed as I am and to be of the representative of Jesus Christ in your very midst. So that's what this is all about. It's a joy to be able to come here and um, rather than having someone do all the liturgy for me, I've been accustomed in my ministry to um, basically take us from the call to worship to the benediction. And so that's what we'll be doing today. I do invite you as part of the announcements to take note of all the items that are in your bulletin. Bible School is a one afternoon event this year at O'Galley Recreation Area in Spring Valley on Wednesday, August 10th. So that's coming up. Um, and the information on how that is organized is in your bulletin. There's a thank you from Corey Moss and, uh, and points of need by the Education Committee is in need of members, Sunday school teachers, uh, there are sign-up sheets in the back, and some very kind and loving people have brought some green groceries in the back, which I believe are intended for you. So, uh, so please take advantage of that this morning. Are there other announcements that are not in your bulletin or that you would like the congregation to be aware of? You are an easy church. We gathered today because today we're used to calling it Sunday, but historically it's been called the Lord's Day because this day is different from all others. And in it, we traditionally have come to worship God, 
Our call to worship this morning is, O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture. We are the sheep who sit in the palm of his very hand. God brings us together as his children. And because we are his children, we are able to turn and welcome one another. Would you please take a moment and do that in a way appropriate to you? Please wave, bump elbows, shake hands. Um, if you decide that you want to give your spouse a kiss, I'll watch the clock. Okay? Let's greet one another in the name of Christ. Good. Sorry, my other hand is <laughs> engaged. One of the other very typical parts of being reformed is that on the frontier, on the Sunday before the Lord's Supper was celebrated in church, people were called to a time of self-examination. And on the East Coast, on the Hudson River, when you came to church the Sunday before the Lord's Supper was served, you were given a wooden coin. It was a communion coin. And it meant that you had been challenged by the pastor and the elders to spend the week looking into your own heart and soul of whether there was anything in your life that was 
not right with God, and that was not the way it should be. And then when you came back to church on the Sunday when the Lord Supper, in the back of the church, you would put your coin into a collection plate. It wasn't worth anything. But in its place, you would take bread and put it on a plate. And only those who had come to church and had examined themselves were made ready. We don't always have that practice anymore. Times have changed. But it's crucial for us that we just don't come to this table willy-nilly. Willy that we come with a mind knowing that God has high expectations for his people. But many times, most of the time, well, let's face it, all the time, we don't live up to God's expectation for us. We call that sin. And because we, even the holiest among us, has just the beginning of the walk with Christ that we should have. We call one, one another to a prayer of confession. And so I invite you as God's people to join me now as we bear our hearts to the one who knows every intimate part of our being. Would you join me? Let us pray. Father, we know what's right and wrong. We've been taught it since we were children. Deep in our hearts, we know that our relationships are not all that they should be, not with one another, and certainly not with you. Oh, we have good intentions. We want to start out well, and it's easy to start out well here at church. But we get worn down during the week when we are treated in ways that are not your ways by others, we also begin to cut corners. We allow thoughts to pollute our minds and even deeds to pollute our actions. Father, forgive us for not being the people we profess to be. For none of us is, not the pastor, not the elders or deacons, not the Sunday school teachers, none of us. And exactly because that is true, we are believers, that we believe there is a path for sinners. And the Apostle Paul, great leader of the faith that he was, told us he was the foremost of sinners. So, Lord, look deep into our lives. You, for whom there are no secrets, see us as we truly are. Help us to be fully known by you so that as we come to you this morning, we may lift up all that we're not proud of all that is polluted and dirty and less than the life Christ calls us to. There's a box in the back for offerings. The Lord, we offer to you our hearts and we know that they're tainted. We know that they're less than pure. But that's what you welcome from us. You welcome us to come to you just as we are. And that's how we come this morning. Have mercy upon your children, upon this pastor, upon this church, that where we are flawed, we might build upon your foundation and be the men and women, the boys and girls that you created us to be. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen.
the Lord says to us that it's with an everlasting love that I will have compassion upon each and every one of you, says the Lord. I am the one who blots out your transgressions, all for my own sake. I will not remember your sins, so return to me, for I have redeemed you. Believe this gospel, and you are able to go forth and live in peace. In your hymnals, and I'm going to invite you to take them, there is a response of reading number 629. Now in many churches, the Ten Commandments are read before the prayer of confession, almost as a reminder of God's high standard and how far we've fallen from it. But Reformed folk do it a little bit different. We use what Martin Luther called the third use of the law, that once we are forgiven, the Ten Commandments no longer remind us of how far we've fallen short, but give us a star to guide us, a guideline for our lives. And so I invite you to turn to 629 with me. Please remain seated and join me as we remember that God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. This is the word of God and the challenge for his people. Let's give him the glory by standing and singing the glory of Patri. As I mentioned earlier in the service, there is a 
collection box in the rear of the sanctuary. A church is dependent upon the, the charity, the good hearts, and the giving spirit of its members. Your church, even though things are rather lean without a pastor right now, still needs you to keep it cool in our beautiful sanctuary. The light's on to keep everything going the way it should go. And so your offerings are needed, and God calls us all to be supportive of the kingdom and the proclamation of the gospel. And so as you are able, your gifts are more than welcome in the box in the back of the sanctuary. Now, we're at that point in the service where we are eager and ready to hear God speak to us. But we don't want to hear just more words. We want the living word of God. And so let's turn to him and ask him to open our minds and our hearts to his spirit. Almighty God, your word is a lamp unto our feet, a light to our paths. It gives meaning to our days, challenge to our lives. It comforts us when life turns in unexpected ways. Speak now that this congregation may not just hear one pastor's opinions, but hear your spirit speaking to our hearts in a way that we need to hear through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Many times we put the pastor and the scriptures up on a pedestal. That's why this platform is up so much higher. And besides, I'm only five foot four, so uh, you want to be able to see who's speaking to you. But we need to bring God's word down to us where we can understand it. And so symbolically, rather than reading from a pulpit, I bring God's word down to you. And in the midst of you, I invite you to hear his holy word. Our first reading is from Hosea. It is not a PG reading. It's meant for mature people. And when I begin to read it, you'll understand why. From Hosea chapter 1, 2 through 10. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go, take for yourself a wife. But take for yourself a wife of whoredom. And have children of whoredom. For the land commits a great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. So Hosea went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblium, and she conceived and bore him a son. And the Lord said to him, Name him Jezreel, for in a little while I will punish the house of Jehu for the blood of Jezreel, and I will put an end to your kingdom of the house of Israel. On that day I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. Well, his wife conceived again, and this time bore a daughter. Then the Lord said to him, Name your daughter Lo Ruhamah, for I will no longer have pity on the house of Israel. I will no longer forgive them. But I will have pity on the house of Judah, and I will save them by the hand of the Lord your God. 
I will not save them by the bow or by the sword or by war or by horses or by horsemen. And when Gomer had weaned Lo Ruhama, she conceived and bore Hosea another son. Then the Lord said to him, Name your son Lo Ami, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. Yet the number of the people of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which can neither be measured nor numbered. And the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, in that place it shall be said to them, you are children of the living God. This is the uncomfortable word of the Lord. We hear in Timothy that all scripture is inspired by God. Good for teaching, even when it is hard and hurts. Our second lesson this morning that goes along with it is from Colossians. In the second chapter, beginning at verse 6 and reading through verse 15. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy, empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the universe, and not according to Christ. For in Christ, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And you have come to fullness in him, who is the head of every ruler and authority, In him also you were circumcised with a spiritual circumcision by putting off the body of the flesh in the circumcision of Christ, all when you were buried with him in baptism. But you were also raised with him through faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. And when you were dead in trespasses, and the uncircumcision of your flesh. God made you alive together with him when he forgave us all our trespasses, erasing the record that stood against us with its legal demands. He set this aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and the authorities and made a public example of them triumphing over them in it, his holy word. This is the word of the, go- of the Lord. May it be blessed and be a blessing to us, God's people. On my drive over this morning on Highway 94, Traffic was a bit heavy, which surprised me on a Sunday morning. And I began to think, this is the season on this last day of July when families are starting to grab their last bit of vacation. This is the time of the year for family trips. And they can be wonderful or as I well remember, they can be real workouts. We have family in Western Michigan, and we would always take a week or two of my vacation, and my wife's a teacher, so she had the summers open, and we would pack up the car, our three children, and basically go to see Grandma and Grandpa on Lake Michigan. 
And because Lake Michigan is a little bit unpredictable, you didn't know whether to wear shorts or long sleeves and sweatshirts and all that stuff. So we had to bring everything, including the kitchen sink. And I would constantly say to my wife, why are we bringing all this junk? Most of it we didn't use anyway. And I'd moan and groan and grump. And even though we had a caravan, cramming it all in there, getting room for the kids. And so she finally got sick and tired of hearing me. And she said, why don't you just shut up and push it all in there? <laughs> That's what happens in the parsonage when you're not looking. So those trips can be real workouts because if you don't plan well for them, every town brings a plea and our children are three years apart. There's the golden arches. Can we stop at McDonald's? Are we there yet? I wonder if that motel has a swimming pool. You know the route. I think it's also inevitable that no one needs a bathroom until you're five miles away from home and the next bathroom is 20 miles away. The antidote? Good planning. Lots of activity packs for kids as well as games looking for Different state license plates. I spy with my little eye, and the kids can be looking out for what's green or what's brown or what's yellow. Today it's a bit easier with DVD players in the back headrests, in the back seats the abundance of technical gadgets to keep a road-weary child entertained. And I think it, we would do well to learn from those summer excursions when it comes to our own spiritual lives. You see, we're all on a journey, on our way back to God especially here in church, we believe there is a heaven. And eventually, all of us want to get there, but none of us want to go there today. But the problem is that we sometimes act like we forget that fact of faith. There's an old black spiritual that sings, this world is not my home. I'm only passing through. I wonder if modern Christians still believe this. I wonder because we don't always live like we believe that this world is not our home. Most of us, and I certainly number myself among that number, have pretty good lives. But many do not. We're told that so many people illegally enter America. Why? Emma Lazarus was a little Jewish girl in New York City in the last century who wrote the poem, The Great Colossus, that is carved into the base of the Statue of Liberty. Give me your poor your huddling masses yearning to breathe free. As a pastor, I'm also tapped by a number of people for financial aid. For those who don't have enough money, you and I see them when you travel in any of our larger cities and even our smaller cities, you'll find people 
looking for money at the malls. Just this past Thursday, I went to the St. Paul Saints baseball game, and there was somebody pounding on a drum as we went by at the end of the game with a bucket for contributions. There's another man playing a saxophone on the street with his case open, hoping that we would kick in a buck or so. There was a scraggly looking man with a beard with a sign that said, homeless veteran needs help. Some of us know what it's like to go through those times. As a college student, when my wife said, I do, to me, and we were juniors in college, my father-in-law said, she's your wife, she's your responsibility. And we're both students and had no way of paying tuition. We scuttled and hurried up and found a job working in all sorts of jobs on campus, but it still wasn't enough. And so my wife and I lived on food stamps that first year of our marriage. It's not easy. It's not life affirming. It doesn't fill you with hope. Life is tough. Hosea found it out when God gave him who, a wife who, if we are polite and we want to be polite in church, we might call her a professional woman, having children from her catting around. And believe it or not, God wanted Hosea to have this horrible family experience. It was unfair. It was unjust. Not what any parent would want for their son or daughter. Yet Colossians reads, continue to live your life in this God. Nobody ever told us that we'd like what God gives us. No one ever told us that we wouldn't be wounded and hurt even when we did the right thing. That's tough. We just had classes exams. And one of the students, Zach DeWitt, I know your search committee has been looking at and he's been looking at you. And he finished up his exams and he did well. But one of the questions that always used to be asked. They put the, the seminary student in the pulpit and the congregation would be filled with pastors and elders. And one of the standard questions in the 1800s was, Mr. Peak, would you be willing to be damned eternally to hell if by going to hell you would glorify God? Would you be willing to spend all eternity in perdition if that would glorify your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? That makes you think, doesn't it? God's intent is not to fill our pockets with dollars. It's not his intent is not necessarily to make us smile for the three score and ten that the Lord assigns to us. But it's that sort of dedication 
when a student can say, yes, if I had to go to hell to glorify my God, I'd be willing to go. It's that sort of dedication that yields results. Maybe not short term, but in the long view. We've heard about those who have died for them, their faith. We call them martyrs. And no martyr relishes pain or death, but they endure both because they're committed to something greater than their own comfort, to someone greater than the pain or even death itself. Will you continue to live your faith in Jesus Christ even when it costs you something? That high cost certainly gives us pause. Remember the Old Testament story of Job? He was the good guy that did everything right and yet Satan wanted to put him to the test and so first he takes away his health and then he takes away his children, and he takes away his wealth, and he leaves them sitting on a pile of ashes. And Job's wife sees his anguish and urges him, curse God and die. Put an end to all this. Even in Jesus' own lifetime, his closest apostle was Peter. And when Jesus told Peter that life was not going to be a bowl of cherries for him, that he had to suffer and die and three days later rise from the dead, Peter objected and said, no Lord, this will never happen to you. And Jesus Christ called his closest friend Satan. When spouses and even best friends try to give you second thoughts, Paul urges, see to it that no one takes you captive. You see, none of us escapes the pitfalls. Health-conscious people get cancer, and they die too. There was a lady in my church in Buffalo Center who would not touch a drop of alcohol for anything. And yet she developed cirrhosis. Your kid may be vaccinated, but catch a deadly disease from another child who wasn't. In my ministry, I buried a 58-year-old motorcyclist who was killed by a distracted driver who was checking her cell phone and crashed head to him head on. None of this is fair, and yet all of it is horribly real. These are the details that sow doubt, undermine faith, these are the details that destroy hope. And yet, in the face of all of them, God made you, he writes to the Colossians, alive together with Christ when he forgave us all our trespasses. You see, God sees this world with different eyes than ours. He invites us forward in life even when that move is painful to us when it doesn't make sense to our minds. Sin has a way of complicating this world, but God's work is forgiveness. Forgiveness for you, forgiveness for me, forgiveness even for our church and all the inequities and injustices and wrong outcomes that are so easy for us to see because they're on the front page of our newspapers. God made us alive with Christ to bless 
this incomplete world and to call everyone to that world that is still in our future. So we're on this journey. Is the Reformed Church in America perfect? Not by a long shot. Is First Reformed Church of Baldwin, Wisconsin perfect? Not by a long shot. Is any one of us the people that God created us to be? Not by a long shot. You see, we come to this table not to say that we are in good graces with God. We come to this table not because we deserve it. But the Lord says come because he knows we need it. If everything in your life is right, if the only next big thing in your life is to go home to be with the Lord and you don't have any sin or any darkness in your life, that table is not for you. But if you're a flawed human being like me, if your church is not all it's cracked up to be, whether on the large scale of the denomination or the small scale of our local congregation, if God is still working on you, he wants to give you the strength to do it. And that's why we come to this table. We are still on the journey. Baldwin is a lovely town. I enjoy coming here. But it's not heaven. And neither is Minnesota where I live. And neither is Iowa where I conducted my ministry. We are all on a journey. And this bread and this cup are intended to strengthen us to finish what God has begun. Let us pray. Father, bless our thoughts. We don't like to hear that we're not who we were supposed to be. But it's our faith in spite of our frailties that calls us to this table. So make us truly ready. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. There are many ways to conduct communion. And again, our church prescribes how we're supposed to do that. What I've chosen to share with you this morning is what I use when I go to the hospital or to the nursing home or to a sick room. And I invite the person that I'm having communion with to remember with me God's most precious promise. We all learned that back in the day when there was only the King James Version and we learned our Bible verses. With Bible school coming up, your children will learn that again too. The most famous, most well-known verse is John 3.16. Don't just hear me say it, but join me if you would as we proclaim for all to hear that God spoke saying, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus wanted us to know that that promise was for you and for me. And so he said, come to me, you who grow weary, you who don't have it all put together, you who are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. It's that rest that we find at this table. And again, not because we're perfect, but because we're needy. 
but the elements are covered. There's a reason there's a lid over the juice, and it's not to keep the flies out of it. There's a reason that there is a cover over the bread, and it's not so that dust doesn't fall on it. The world sees a thimble of juice and a little square of bread. But the scriptures talk about a great banquet. It takes faith to see that. It takes faith to know that what happens at this table will strengthen you and me. The church has confessed its faith in many ways. One of the earliest known creeds was simply Jesus is Lord. The church has grown a little bit more sophisticated over the years and has formalized our confession of faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. In a moment, you will see it on the screen in front of you. And as we confess our faith, as we profess our faith, what is hidden will become revealed and we will be invited to come to our Lord's table. And so if we could have the Apostles' Creed on the screens, please, and I invite you to confess it with me. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitted at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And God makes it all available to us. There wasn't a whole lot of hoopla around that first Lord's Supper. It was Jesus gathered with his friends, much as we're gathered here today. And as they gathered around the table, he took what was common in every day, bread. I used to have children at my church that said, Pastor, communion would be a lot better if you put a little peanut butter on it. Jesus didn't have peanut butter. So he took what he had and he gave thanks to God. And after he had thanked the Lord, he broke the bread. And he gave it to them. And he said, this bread is the communion of my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat all of it in remembrance of me. And when they were finished with the supper, he took the cup and he gave it to them saying, this cup is the New Testament, the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink all of it in remembrance of me. In a moment, the elders will come forward, and when they do, they will, they will stand here on either side of the center aisle with bread and cup. We, what we invite you to do is to take the elements from them and eat and drink, and then place your cup back into the tray. And then after they have served you, I will serve them and Cassie, and we will all commune together. 
there also happens to be on each of the trays a little plastic cup with gluten-free wafers for those of you who need that ability. There is something for all God's people here. And so I invite you to come forward. Elders, if you would at this time, for all things are now ready. Would you come forward, please?
stay right here. To follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me. Turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. No turning. No turning back. Will you decide now to follow Jesus? Will you decide now to follow Jesus? Will you decide now to follow Jesus? No turning back. No turning. This bread which we have broken and this cup which we bless, they are to us the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we all take, eat and drink. Lord, now let us thou of thy servants depart in peace. According to thy word, for our eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. Brothers and sisters in Christ, let us pray. Father, as we've come needy and needing your help, we know that there are members of our number who also stand in need of that help. They are the aged. They are the sick. They are the folks who are unable to be here today. They are the church where we gather in worship here in Baldwin, but they are the church so much larger than what we see on any given Sunday morning. Father, you know the confusion and the dissension that fills our denomination right now. Let your way be made clear for this church as it considers its future, for its committee as it considers the prophet that you intend to lead this body of believers. We pray, O oh Lord, for elders and deacons, for Sunday school teachers and education committees, for boys and girls getting ready for vacation Bible school, and the fun and the songs and the crafts and the stories that will shape and form their lives. I thank you, O oh Lord, for the hospitality that First Reformed Church extends each week to a different pastor and this morning has extended to me. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would Bless those in ministry and leadership positions and ask that you would be glorified by the way we live our lives and carry forward the ministry you place upon each of us. Now hear our prayer. 
in all the silent prayers of our heart for our leaders, both in government as well as in church. We lift them to you on the very words that Jesus himself taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As I mentioned to you the last time I was privileged to be here, God doesn't call us together without sending us away different on a mission. So I invite you to stand and receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto each and every one of you. May the Lord lift up his joy and overflow you with its reality. Through Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's sing the doxology as we wrap up worship this morning. And let me say good morning. Thank you for allowing me to run 15 minutes long. And God bless you. <laughs>